My name is Michael the Hebrew Hammer Brown, and I should be joined shortly by Daniel Olinger, the editor-in-chief for SB Nation Northwestern. He also covers the Philadelphia 76ers. So until then, you just have me. Let's try and make the best of it. Um, before we get started, it's an important time to note that Sim Bull is the stock market for sports where you can buy and sell virtual shares of your favorite teams using real money. Each time your team wins, you earn a payout. If your team loses, you lose nothing. Symbol offers trading for NFL, NBA, and MLB with college football coming this fall. Visit Symbol.com today and use promo code BSWPOD to earn a $10 deposit bonus on your first deposit. That's S-I-M-B-U-L-L dot com. Uh, so once again, ladies and gentlemen, episode 156 of Beer Sports Whatever. BSW is proud to be on the Around the Block platform. We are live here on Facebook and Twitter. So once again, we are hoped to be joined um, by Daniel Olinger of SB Nation Northwestern here shortly. As soon as he comes on, we will bring him into the fold. But until then, let's get caught up on the sports news of the day. First thing, Texas, University of Texas and the Oklahoma University are not renewing their Big 12 media rights once their contract is up in 20 and 25. Oklahoma and Texas officially notified the Big 12 today that they will not be renewing their grants of media rights following their expiration in 2025, according to a joint statement released by both schools. Big 12 sources told ESPN on Monday that a statement that the statement leaves wiggle room and doesn't fully guarantee the flagship schools will remain in the league through 2025. If you're watching the show right now and you are a fan of the University of Texas or Oklahoma, I want to hear from you. What are your thoughts on the impending move to the SEC for your schools? Let me be honest here, right? I don't have a dog in the fight. You know, I'm just a, a, a fan. I've always leaned towards the University of Texas versus Texas A&M. My dad and my sister both went to the University of Texas. I think, first of all, it's an absolute travesty that the University of Texas and A&M do not play in football every single season. No disrespect to any of the other sports, uh, tennis, basketball, baseball. You know, they do play in baseball every year, but the matchup that every single person wants to see and – we are joined by the GOAT, Daniel Olinger, as we are talking a little bit of college football. Daniel, how are you, sir? Hey, Michael. I'm, I'm doing well. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Oh, absolutely. We were just talking a little college football. Are you a uh, – obviously, you're you're big into Northwestern, so uh, you, you enjoy college football. Uh, I mean, I go to Northwestern, so it's kind of, you know, prerogative. But, uh, no, I've always loved college football uh, growing up. Uh, you know, parents from Ohio, so – if if your parents are from Central Ohio, you like grew up watching Ohio State football, no matter where you were raised. So I, I I've I've watched football, college football most of my life, and can talk about it. And I'm guessing you're probably talking about the Texas and Oklahoma news of the last few days. You're very smart. Uh, nothing gets by you. And yes, you do go to Northwestern because you graduated in 23. And I thought to myself, I was like, wait a minute, he's graduating in 23. He knows way yeah. too much about basketball to still be in school. Like you're going to be a powerhouse. By the time you graduate college, right? I mean, uh, that's the that's the hope. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're talking about OU in Texas. Um, we're going to get to, obviously, some NBA draft stuff here in a second. But just to kick off the show, um, I mean, I love the fact of Texas and OU going to the SEC. I know I'm in the minority, but the fact that Texas doesn't play A&M every year is a travesty. And good for the SEC. The SEC is trying to create the greatest conference that they can. Going to get Texas and OU is the greatest thing out there. I mean, you can't do any better than adding those two schools on the open market. How do you feel about the move? Your first thoughts. Uh, you know that Darren Ravel tweet where he's like, I feel bad for our country, but this is tremendous content. Yep. Um, that's probably like an accurate summation of what's been going on. Like, you know, I feel bad for the Big 12 and some of those schools in the Big 12 that kind of feels like, you know, like, I mean, the Big 12 is probably not going to be a thing in a few years at this rate. Like, I... I doubt, like, I don't know how they could survive. And, yeah, it's going to be, like, like it's hard to complain. You're like, yeah, well, I would like to watch, like, Texas, Alabama, like, three out of every four years. Like, that'll be fun. It'll be fun. Um, and, you know, great. 
and being in the oh, SEC, no. maybe like Texas and Oklahoma, like step up. Because I mean, Oklahoma, like challenge wise, obviously is like, well, they're not Alabama or they haven't won a title like LSU. They're obviously on that like tier of upper echelon college football teams that can compete. And then Texas, you're wondering like they can probably be like a Florida level team or like, you know, in the right year they're competing. Um, so it'll be fun. Um, I, I mean, we've been talking about it inside you like, uh, cause now like the, the like news going around is that Kansas and Iowa state might try and jump to the big 10. Um, it's so weird. Kansas is such a weird school. Cause you know, you get them for like men's basketball. And it's like, suddenly they're the, they're the team of the conference. Cause they're basically their whole shtick is they win their conference every year in basketball. But then in football, it's like, Again, it's such a wide disparity between one of the absolute best basketball programs you're going to get and then a football program that's probably the worst in Power 5 at the moment. And then Iowa State. Like, Iowa State's interesting. Like, I mean, I, I don't know what to think about Iowa State, just, like, kind of thinking that in the future they – um, it just really depends on if Matt Campbell stays or not. It's, like, the big thing. I don't understand why Houston – I went to the University of Houston, right? And for years we've had little brother syndrome. Nobody wants us. And I don't get it. Like, I, you just described it. Great football success over a full three- or four-year stretch. You know, you went to – you beat Florida State and Oklahoma in back-to-back games. Brand-new facilities on campus. Basketball team just went to the Final Four. One of the best track teams in the country. Uh, softball, solid program. Baseball, solid program. But U of H is like that weird, like, where do they go? I've always said the Pac-12 is the spot for Houston. No questions asked. That is the best spot for them, bar none. But it's like, I want to go somewhere. You know, now we can't even get into the Big 12 more than likely. I mean, well, that's that was kind of be my idea. Like, if all these schools leave the Big 12, but the Big 12 doesn't want to totally disband, like, Houston's obviously got to be one of your first calls, if not the first call. Um, I mean, what are we doing here? You know, like, what the, what the hell are we doing like, here? Like, good at football, good at basketball, uh, basically. Just give them what you want. And, like, I mean, I don't know. You would know better than me. I think Houston, like – because usually these smaller schools stepping up, you think, like, even if they're good, like, like, it's probably the thing, like, um back, they could still do it now, but especially in the late 2000s when Boise State was, like, had an mm-hmm. argument for best team on the Pacific Coast for, like, five years. Um, you would think, why, like, like little kid me thought, why can't they just join the Pac-12? They're clearly good enough. But it also has to do with, like, yeah, and Boise State was really cool, and they had a lot, of, they got some really diehard fans, but it's like, yeah, they're not really getting a ton of a city out in Idaho, which they're just trying to buy a con. Like Houston's different. Like Houston is, of course, a, a real city with a lot of with a lot of potential that you can do. It. And like it's had, like you said in the past, like some very good success. Success. Um, I mean, obviously having like I mean, what like I just we're talking when a transition to the NBA. Like Hakeem Olajuwon and Clyde Drexler played at their school at the same time, and Hakeem's like uh, you can argue about it. Definitely a top like fifteen player all time. Probably top ten. Like. One of the greatest play, one of the greatest players to ever play the game went to that school and like is very well known. Like it's a, you're obviously like Houston's one of those of the schools that could definitely jump up. Houston like you know has to be one of them. Like they're definitely capable of it. Yeah, I mean like look, I love Hakeem Olajuwon, top ten player of all time. Might be stretching it. He's definitely in the top fifteen. I'm I'm with you. You watch his, you watch his defense. Like I don't. It's, he's incredible. It's, it's he's incredible. Insane. Yeah, it's insane. And like, the people that want now, no disrespect to your 76ers, all right. You want to compare Joel and B to Kim Olajuwon, you're out of your mind because they're not, I, I, they're I, not I, even in the same weight class. I just like the, I think the comparison more stems from like an archetype where it's, um, because I, the idea is they both have, well, it's just like the similar idea of neither of them are actually great passers because that's not Embiid's strength. That was never Hakeem's strength, but there's such dominant low post scores. Like there's a theory of them where if you just put four shooters around them, like, Necessarily, they don't always scale well to playing with other great like on ball creators, but just if you put like spacing around them, it's just very hard to stop them because then they just kind of. I, I'm not, I know, I, I would never say Embiid's like he's not, he's not better than Hakeem, he's not at Hakeem's level like that. And of course, that's like, I mean, it's not saying much because Hakeem again is one of the greatest players ever. I, I just understand the comparison from at least like the archetype of what kind of players they are, it's similar, like just the kind of the molds they follow. Like, yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. Just like, oh, it does. Just keep it there, though. Yeah, the, the theory of the understand, like, the concept of why they're successful is similar. That's fair. Yeah. People putting them on the same pedestal need to, to calm down a little bit. I mean, two NBA championships for a game. Get the hell out of here. Staying on the topic of basketball, what the hell is going on with Team USA basketball? This is the most embarrassing thing I think I have ever watched. And I sat through an entire season 
of the Houston Rockets and what they did last year. What's going on with Team USA basketball right now is the most embarrassing thing I've ever seen with a basketball team, period, in my life. Convince yeah, me otherwise. I mean, I haven't got to watch too much of it because, uh, like, what was it? They, they don't, like, show it on the regular channels. They, like, force you to have to pay for Peacock on the streaming. And, like, yep. I, I'm still, like, I mean, I'm still a college kid. I'm trying to save money where I can. <laughs> um, I mean, I've, heard, I've seen some good, pe- like, really smart people put out theories about, like, just – of the team construction, you know, like I, it's something I always stress too is like there's not a ton of great passers on this team, and it's almost led to like overpassing where they're almost questioning it. It just, it I don't know how. So like I'm just trying to think through the roster at the moment because it's Durant, Tatum, Dame. Um, they've, they've got something named a Keldon Johnson from the San Antonio okay. Spurs. Well, Keldon's actually hasn't Keldon actually been pretty good from what I've heard. Like he Keldon's, 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 Keldon's athletic and like gets up and down the court, and also. I remember I was talking about this with my brother the other day. It's just because Anthony Davis was hurt, so obviously he wasn't going to play. Then you look at the other best big men in the league, and you're like, they're all foreign. Joel Embiid is foreign. Giannis Antetokounmpo is foreign. Rudy Gobert is foreign. Nicole Giochic is foreign. Um, Could have taken Christian Wood, who plays for the Houston Rockets, is a pretty good player. Yeah, this- I mean, Christian would, have been, Christian would probably be a good option. But, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, just, like, you look around, it's like, huh, like, because they've had some struggles with, like, interior big guys with, like, some size – Issues with like a lot of the best big guys in the world are all from different countries. You still have Draymond Green, and it's no disrespect to Keldon Johnson. I don't care. Look, you can play whatever. You're the United States of America. You don't lose in the Olympics in basketball. It's just, we don't do that. It's not something that we do. Popovich needs to go. I hate to say that. I respect the hell out of Popovich, but he's got to go. You can't lose the way they've lost over the past couple of weeks and come back the way I see it. I don't understand uh, Fox Sports Radio. Dan Byer was talking about it today. Everybody needs to calm down about USA basketball losing. It, I, I'm not going. How? Like you're Team USA. You have the greatest talent in the world. Figure it out. But they're making excuses now. That's the world that we live in. Do you, do you agree with that sentiment or not? That they're talking about, oh, we haven't had enough time to practice and do all this. You have Kevin Durant, you have Jason Tatum, you have Draymond Green, you have Damian Lillard. Like, what else do you want? Go win a medal. And they still can, you know. But the fact that they take JaVel McGee, are you kidding me? JaVel McGee is an Olympian? That's a problem. That's a major problem that the Team USA has. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, obviously they're probably, no matter what, like, reasons we're going to say, I think you can, like, point to legitimate reasons for why they're not working. Um it's obviously like they still should win is probably the bottom line. Um, again, I think it goes into like how you view team construction and roster building, just necessarily putting like all the most talented guys that you have available to you on the roster. Isn't always the best idea because just like, it is important to under Cause like, just, I mean, it's like a very simple concept, but like, of course that we've all said before, like there's one basketball and understanding how to like, work through a team like there's a there's an advantage to having like low usage players like um we'll talk about him later but like this is one of the arguments i have for like one of the draft prospects kessler edwards where it's like that's he our guy he, that's soaks our guy. Up, he soaks up like not a lot of usage but can still be very efficient for basketball on both ends of the court and that's just very useful to have and i i mean it's probably like it's why it hurts like because i mean so step because like steph curry's not playing he's one of those guys who i think like just obviously like you can put Steph in any kind of situation and he succeeds just because he basically is perfectly use you can use him perfectly on the ball or off the ball. And that's just very, that's one of the most thing, awesome things in basketball where you can just, you basically are such a great weapon on both sides that you can just play in any situation will be fine. So yeah, I, I would say that again, I haven't watched them enough to know that like exactly what's probably the problem. And I do know that there are some really good teams like, and like around the world, like it is true that the foreign teams have co- like other countries have caught up in terms of like developing ta- talent, getting better, better, like catching up to the USA. Like I said, although you can probably make a case that most of the best big men in the world are all international players. But um, yeah, it's just it's not it's not good. It's, it's regardless. It's not good. Trevor makes a great point. Like Daniel, we live in an era now where all of these guys have excuses. It's always something. We didn't have enough time to practice. We didn't have this. Like, there's no swagger, I feel like, like anymore. Like, it's almost a bad thing to throw, go out there and act like 
Like, we're Team USA. We are going to beat the hell out of you, and you're going to accept it, and we're going to move on with our lives. Like, there's no, like, nad. You know what I mean? Like, where is Draymond Green in the locker room throwing stuff around in the locker room saying, what the hell is going on here? Is it a lack of playing for your national team? I don't know. I don't know what it is, but it's embarrassing, and I'm sick and tired of it. I watched the entire game. And, yes, the rest of the world has great talent. If you lose to a team led by Evan Fournier, something is wrong. I mean, I, I watched a bunch of Sixers teams lose to Magic teams led by Evan Fournier for many years. So, uh, I mean. <laughs> I like Evan Fournier. I Look, I like Evan Fournier. Evan Fournier does not, should not be scoring 28 points against, against Team USA. That's unacceptable. It's absolutely unacceptable. Yeah, I mean, again, I haven't probably seen enough because do the streaming, like limited streaming access uh, to really say what's probably going on with them. It's, I mean, yeah, I, I honestly, I just like, I don't want to say too much about them when I don't know for sure, like what's going on, but obviously it's not good. It's, I got you. Look, I'm, we're family now at this point. You've appeared on the podcast. We're, you know, we're, we're second cousins. Now I got you on all things Team USA. Let's get to the draft. That's what, that's what you're here to talk about. Let's get to the draft. Um, report came out today from Woj. Tell me if you believe this story or not, that the internal meetings are still revolving around three guys for the number one pick. Cade Cunningham, Evan Mobley, Jalen Green. Do you, are you buying or selling that they have not made their decision at the number one pick yet? Uh, I mean, they can say they haven't made it, but that's just more like, you know, it's like probably when you've decided like a college, but you're just afraid to put it down yet. Like what you want to take. I, I like, I, I, if it's not Cade Cunningham, I would be shocked. Um, I, I can't really see how it won't be Cade. He's, he's that good. Like you, I, I'm pretty sure you just take him and roll with it. Uh, obviously the second and third picks, like who goes at each of those spots is definitely much more up in contention, but I would say I, I, I'm going to like, I'm going to be very shocked if Cade Cunningham doesn't go number one. On the, if, the if you were the Rockets, who would you take it to if, if Cade goes one? I would take Evan Mobley, probably. Um, like, I like just, you even more. I like you even more. Like, defensively, just like an unreal prospect in terms of like, like, dudes that tall are not supposed to move like that. It's just such a, it's, and I've, I've we seen like with, in the NBA recently, like, I mean, heck, like, he's obviously not necessarily these, these guys especially yet, but two, two guys who just won championships the last years and Giannis and Anthony Davis, like, if you're that tall and can move like that with that kind of length, like, it just opens up so much. And people too, too often probably think, like, oh, you're, you say that about every dude who's skinny and tall with, like, well, absurd wingspan. Like, I didn't, like, say that about, like, Mo Bamba. <laughs> like, like, I like Mo, like, Mo coming out of Texas, like, yeah, he couldn't really – move like that Evan Mobley can move like that <laughs> and it's really impressive to watch um Mobley, I, is, Mobley is special like Mobley yeah, is a special yeah. talent in my eyes yeah he's like and it's no knock against Jalen Green Jalen Green's like obviously a good prospect too it's it's a very good like top four probably like they're all very good prospects it's just I, I think Mobley is the kind of guy you again like K like I I probably wouldn't overthink especially for Rockets team where yes you have Christian Wood but this is still, like you said last year, the Rockets were hard to watch. I think you don't really consider fit when you're making this pick. Because, like, as I've heard someone say, like, fit implies that when you've you've currently constructed something that it needs to fit into to keep success going. And that's not the case with the Rockets at the moment. I, I go go I go back and forth, man. Like, one day I wake up and I'm, and I'm part of the Mobley mob. The next day I wake up, I'm a part of the Green Gang. They can use both of them. And I've said it since day one to my co-pilot, Jeremy Brenner, on the Dream Shakes, the Dream Take, that if they don't take Mobley, they have to figure out man in the middle. Like, I'm okay if they take green, but you have to get a guy that is a back-to-the-basket type of defender, like a true rim protector, which they don't have. And the scariest part of this, Daniel, is the Rockets, if they would have kept their core together, if they would have kept their team together from 18 – they would have won it all this year. They would have been the best team in the league. So yeah, that's like so that's I'm just remembering Chris Paul Harden. Uh, are we assuming that Ariza gets moved because Ariza is probably like too old at this point? Potentially, but I'm talking about you keep Chris Paul. You would have had Harden. You would have had Capella. You would have PJ. kept PJ. You'd have Eric Gordon, and you would have added pieces around them. That core, I think, wins the title this year. Mm. I do. I do think it's interesting because. I was never a huge Chris Paul fan for like these last two years. And just there was definitely something he did different with his body after he got traded for Houston. Like whether that's like, you know, 
motivated after the trade to get into a certain kind of shape. Like he's looked better ever since he left Houston. Like obviously he was still good in Houston. So like I would be interested like in that what if like how does he develop from there? But yeah, I mean honestly like it's the thing the 2018 Rockets like I I don't know if I'm allowed to bring it up on this pod, but like you know some games yeah. can, like if, if just a few of those threes fall. There's a chance or like those games go differently. There's a chance they. I mean, they, whoever won was going to sweep the Cavs in the finals, probably. So, not even close. Not even close. They would. It wouldn't have been close either. Like so, in the finals. Like, yeah. Yeah, it's just like, but you know, that's the way it's. It's it really sucks for the Rockets and like what the Rockets obviously did should not be considered a failure. Like I take it from someone who's watched the Sixers now his whole life. Like, and they have not made so the only conference fi- conference finals they made in my lifetime technically. I was like three months old when the O one Sixers were in the finals. And that's the only time they've made the conference finals in my lifetime. Like, as much success as the Rockets had in the playoffs under Harden, like, it's just, it's something that doesn't happen for most franchises. So, like, I would say Houston fans, like, yeah, like, it, it really sucks that you didn't get a title after that, that whole run of success. Um, and I, I don't know what to say besides, like, it is really cool what you got to do. But just, I mean, hey, sometimes these things bounce this way. Like, that that goes wrong for Houston, whereas the Bucks like, get a few bounces their way against the Nets, and they were ready to win a title after that, so... You know, it's just the way things go sometimes. I don't want to talk about the 18 Rockets because it just makes it honestly just it hurts my heart because I, I went to, I went to all of the games. I was at every playoff game that year. They they were really good. They were very very good. Yeah. I, all right. Moving back to the draft. Um, came out with my first mock draft. Not my first, but my official mock draft today. I want to get your thought on a couple of guys. See what you think. Are you team Scotty Barnes over Jonathan Kaminga as not necessarily where he gets drafted, but his outlook in the league? Scotty Barnes to me is going has the potential of being in an all NBA type, all first, all NBA first team type of guy. Um, I know Kaminga gets a lot of love. I love Scotty Barnes though from Florida State. Yeah. Um I have him going number five to Orlando. I- I will preface everything by saying, like, I have – well, I've seen most of the guys in the class. Like, I've definitely looked more at guys later on because that's where the Sixers are picking. Um, so, I would probably not be the Scotty versus Kaminga expert. That said, um, geez, I, I think I would probably lean Scotty, but, like, I don't know how much I would love either of them, like, in the top five, given their mm-hmm. limitations as shot creators probably. Um, Scott Scotty's interesting because I, I, my good friend Mark Schindler did a – a lot of work on him, like at right both from writing and podcasting. Like it's got incredible he's like got incredible length. Uh he's one of definitely one of the more fun guys to watch. Like very vocal the whole game. A lot of celebrations. Just a very like enjoyable guy to watch. Um he really he has this weird thing though where he is like because he's he's tall, he has good length and he probably plays for Florida State. Everyone says oh he's probably a really good athlete, but like he can't jump that well which is why he's like steel and block numbers weren't super high. Like almost all of his athleticism is based on his length and how he can use it, which is still like, valuable, but like, it's just different. And obviously like the shots are probably like the, the concern with Scotty is just that he probably, there's a good chance he might have to play center in the league to really be successful. And you know, if it works as like a small ball center, like that kind of thing like that, that's great. But like, it is, it's like the idea of when a, a smaller shot creator gets picked. Like they kind of have to make shots then to make a lot of really difficult shots to be good. Like Scotty has to do some really difficult things on defense. And honestly, in terms of like probably playmaking short role to be good on offense, which it could happen. It's just a hard thing to bet on. Uh, Kaminga just seems like it's going to take a while. If it does come a, you know, shot is behind, like playmaking reads are a little behind, just like the feet. He has like, again, like he has the archetype that's very appealing that like, he looks like a bigger creator, who, but which is obviously like the most valuable thing in the NBA is when you get those like six six to two six nine wings who can like run offense. But and that would be like the theory of coming by. I don't. I would doubt it's there. Uh, so I would lean Scotty. Um, but I, I definitely think there's very valid concerns about both of them as prospects. I have Franz Wagner going number nine to Sacramento. I, I like. I, I love Franz. He's good. See, okay. I I watch tape of him and it's hard for me to get excited about him at the next level. Like, I think he screams to me Wally Zerbiak. Well, he doesn't play like Wally. Because, like, Wally was a uh, – because it wasn't – I mean, you probably remember Wally better than me because like, Wally's whole thing was, like, movement shooting, right? He 
just the way that, and I hate being that guy that only compares like a white guy to another white guy, like they do in the draft all the time. Like NFL is predominantly guilty of that. But like, I just watch him and I'm like, he's there, but what does he do? Sell me on Franz Wagner because so yeah. I want get me on the hype train for him because I watch video and I'm like, hey, he's good. But if my team drafted him, I'd be like, you know, Chandler Parsons, Wally Zerbiak ish. Well, the thing about Franz is that, like, the reason I think some people are underwhelmed by him is that probably, like, the least appealing aspect of his game is just, like, his willingness to score. Like, he he doesn't think of himself as, like, I contribute to my team by, like, going out and scoring 20 tonight. That's not, like, his mentality in terms of, like, that's how I'm going to win. So you'll see him, like, I think uh, draft Twitter guru, guru uh, PD Webb's coined it, like, Academy Brain, where he's, like, wired to try and make the quote-unquote right play, even though sometimes, like, you know, don't let – good be the enemy of great or so i don't know if that's the right phrase but like he'll pass he can he can get a little too comfortable looking to pass instead of and passing up shots he should take but like the dude does a lot of stuff very well and like i mean i love betting on wings in general but like he's a very solid spot up shooter like i think he's got he's going to shoot it well in the nba and i like i mean the fit of the canes i think is pretty fun just him and halliburton it's gonna be a lot of great decision making he ran a lot of like sh- short side pick and rolls like once you gave it to him on a side instead of from out top of the key. And he like, he's very good at making pocket passes, attacking the rim and then dishing off. Like, I I just think a very good pick and roll passer overall. And then defensively, like I I was furious basically when big 10 media didn't vote Franz for a first team, all big 10 defense. Cause that dude was just like giving other big 10 wings and guards, like just torture. They could not like, I mean, honestly a good game to watch is like Florida state versus Michigan in the tournament where Franz just flat out outplayed Scotty. He was just better than him all game. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, he, like, just – because he's a similar prospect, like, incre- some really good length where – and he has, like, ri- just very good position awareness where some guys get a little too content, like, trying to trust their athleticism and running side by side of guys as I drive with them. Franz, like, is just – it doesn't seem like he gets beat like that. He really, like, when a guy comes out to him, they're almost always running into his chest or his core because he just reacts very well to that and has an understanding of where they're coming at him. And even if he does get beat for a second again, he has really good length and very quick load time off the ground to get blocks and stuff. So I think you like, I mean, I'm not just thinking, like, if you play with the Canes, like Franz, Fra- like Korf, like Wagner, uh, Halliburton, and Fox, like, I just think that could real. that's a lot of good decision making in one team, I think. And I just think it's a really good thing to have. So I, like, yeah, I think it's just a hard thing. It's like, <laughs> it's a tale as old as time. The guy, the dude's probably the least attractive thing about his, like, profile as a prospect is his scoring. But I think he's going to be still just a very valuable player for a team. You sold me. You moved me a little bit. A little bit. A tad. Um, all right. 19 and 21 for the Knicks. I want your opinion on if this were to come to fruition. I have him taking Miles McBride, West Virginia at 19, and Isaiah Jackson at 21, big man out of Kentucky. So I can talk a lot about Deuce, cause that, Deuce which is Miles McBride's nickname. Is, that's I mean that's bonus points. One of the better nicknames in the draft, Deuce McBride. Um, but uh, yeah, because he's a guy who's been mocked to the Sixers some at twenty eight. Um, I've probably seen him as high as the early twenties, as late as like the late uh, the early first round. So like that twenty to like early twenties, early thirties range is probably what you're looking at. Um, I was a little lower on on him at first because I thought the big pitch on him was like that shot creator with also some really great point of attack defense. And I was a little worried about the defense because he does do the same where he's like a very over aggressive jumping out at dudes, especially mm-hmm. like against Baylor. It was a problem when he was guarding Jared Butler, who just basically Deuce would get too far up. And that's a ve- Jared Butler. Another guy's going to be in the NBA. It was just like once he was like giving him an advantage, like kind of trusting that he could recover and he really couldn't. But there is also something to say West Virginia's like whole scheme was just like press over pressure every single player and hope they commit, they make mistakes, which kind of works. It didn't work as much this past year, but, like, you know, it's one of those things where, like, is that really Deuce making those decisions, or is it, like, being told, like, hey, you jump out at everyone? Um, and I do think there was something to be said for. So his efficiency wasn't great. If I remember correctly, like, 54 true shooting percentage uh, took some bad long twos. Like, I think it's fine to get to, like, he's really good at getting to that short mid-range area, especially on post-ups. Like, he can bully smaller guards. He's a... He's a very strong for his like. He's, even though he's only like six two, six three, he can like back guys down to our smaller guards and get good shots over them, which I like. He does have a tendency to like take step backs with his feet still inside the line, 
which and he did not make a ton of them, which that can be a problem. But there is also something he said, like West Virginia did not have a ton of like basically was by far the best ball handler on their team. And like the only one who could really create shots consistently off the dribble from the perimeter. So they asked him to do a hard roll. It's like my argument that I had for Shake Milton most of this year of the Sixers, where I would defend him by saying, yeah, Shake was struggling at times, but they were asking him to do the hardest job in basketball, which is make a ton of shots off the dribble and keep running these pick and rolls all game. And of course, you're going to be a little worse than that if you're not completely suited to it. So it's like maybe if you put Deuce in a system where he doesn't have to do that much. And I would I would worry about that with the Knicks just maybe because I think the Knicks do need someone who can do more of that. And I don't know if that's Deuce's best role. Like, I think Deuce might be better if you scale him down in the NBA to more focus on, like, he's a pr- very good, pretty much spot-up three-point shooter uh, and just has athletic tools, like, if you use him in the right ways. Like, just I- I'm not exactly sure what you can do with him yet because we didn't get to see it a ton at West Virginia, but, like, he has all the, like, the requisite athletic tools to then maybe get become a better cutter, become, like, again, a better team defender, do some of those things. So I think, I think he... I don't hate that. I just, I, I'm at this point, I'm very like, it's very weird how I view Deuce. I don't know really what to do with him yet. Uh, Isaiah Jackson, like, again, I haven't seen a ton of him, but like, it, I don't know if I love the theory of him, which is just like raw big man with energy and like length and some bounce. Um, yeah. I mean, for the it's, Knicks, it's my, tough. My, my big, like, so I, I didn't, so in your mock, like, was uh, Sharif Cooper out of Auburn still, still there for New York? I have him going 24 to the Rockets. See, I, I would take Sharif. I think the Knicks should take Sharif if he's there because you get a guy who can, like, uh, the way I describe Sh- what Sharif does best, Sharif, like, people don't understand how hard it is to change directions with a basketball in your hand, especially being guarded by NBA level defenders. Sharif can, like, change directions just effortlessly. It's really impressive. And then he also has, like, an incredible understanding of where, like, passing space will open up. He's like, probably the best lob thrower and one of the best passers in the class. And I just think the Knicks could really use someone like that, who they could start setting those ball screens for, especially in a playoff setting. And he can start to orchestrate the offense. The shot does need to improve as does some, like he's not a huge guy, but like, I think with his ball, with his like incredible handling and passing, he can like kind of orchestrate their half court offense more, which, so I think he would be my pick for the Knicks if he was there personally. Uh, but I could definitely hear the argument for Deuce. Gotcha. Um, moving to the Rockets, top topic of the night, biggest biggest draft for the Rockets since been a while. I would say at least ten years. Uh, twenty three and twenty four. I've got them taking my favorite prospect in the entire draft on the defensive side of the ball, Usman Garuba out of Spain. I think he's an absolute stud. Uh, and then I've got him taking Sharif Cooper at twenty four. Um, other players in mind for this pick. I love Jared Butler. Oh, I love uh, Jared too. <laughs> um, I'm going to get to the Sixers pick that I have coming up in a few minutes, but what are your thoughts on Garuba and Cooper at 23 and 24? Well, I mean, I already talked about Cooper. Um, yeah. I, I just generally think he's pretty good. So, you know, if the Rockets, like if he's there for the Rockets at 23, 24, again, like I don't think any position should probably be off limits for the Rockets. So, you know, I'd say go for it. Um, Garuba would be interesting, especially because I actually don't know if it makes sense if you take Mobley just because Garuba's best position in the NBA mm. is probably center. I agree. And it's not even like that it's bad to get – it's just because like I feel like you might be in, stunting Garuba's de, de, uh, development in that case. Because well, like, cause, like the go back. best way to develop is to become like – to get NBA reps at that. And I just don't see how he plays in front of Mobley or just like then – I mean, I just see your – because Mobley and Garuba, like, I think they could both eventually shoot one day, but I don't think they can. Like, that is one thing I would say. If it's if it's Mobley, Garuba, and Cooper, like, I don't think they have very good merits as a prospect. You play all three of them at the same time, your spacing is just going to be very untenable. for Like, be prepared to watch some bad spacing that first year. Do you think Garuba's more of a center? Because I see him more as a – I mean, a hybrid four. Like, I think he would be the perfect guy to put next to Christian Wood. As an example, like if they draft Jalen Green and they can get Garuba, I think a front court of Jay Sean Tate, uh, Garuba, and Wood with a back court of Kevin Porter Jr. and Jalen Green, that would be a. I would watch that five. I just want to know, like, it's hard for me to tell you where Garuba's rim protection gets in the NBA. Cause, like you said, Christian Wood, as good as he is, probably the thing he needs most is to bring rim protection. Mm-hmm. So. 
I would say it is tenable then if Garuba like really can develop as a rim protector in that sense and play that role. I'm just not sure if that's the case. And again, like I'm, I was coming out from the theory of like, if you take Mobley, who I, who would be personally be my pick. Um, yeah. Like that was saying, if you take Jalen green, I'd probably be fine with the Garuba pick at 23, even though like, and it's not, again, it's not like you have to fit these pieces into starting line, but I'm just thinking if you're trying to develop each of these guys, mm-hmm. I just don't know if like, again, like I just, I think I would worry about the reps Garuba gets if Mobley's there, if he has Mobley and Christian Wood in front of him when he's getting his reps so, but like you said, if it takes Jalen Green and then and then you take Garuba at twenty three, I think that makes a lot more sense. Um, yeah, I mean that that could it's definitely interesting. I mean that's a cool thing about the Rockets, like having three first round picks and one of the number two is you be, you're getting a bunch of new tools to use for like your whole season. No, I t- I totally agree. Um, let me so getting to the 76ers pick, I have y'all taking Jared Butler out of Baylor. Uh, well, I mean. I, I've I talked think, about Jared so many times now. I love him so much. I think he would honestly be the steal of the draft because the only thing that that dude has going against him is health. That's it. Like if he gets clear, if he gets cleared, well, I mean, he like, got clear. He gets clear. He mm-hmm. got cleared to play. It's just like what and NBA front offices have to consider. Like, hey, maybe in two years it pops up again, and this is a problem. Is basically what it's down to. Like, because the NBA says to let him play. So, uh, yeah, no, but Jared, like, basically, I think our guy Kessler Edwards is the one that I only guy I would probably, if he's there at 28, I would prefer over Jared. But Jared Butler, I think, like, mainly I want the Sixers to take a wing at 28. Um, I think they could use more size and sh- shooting off their bench, and that could really be an easy position to slot in there. And there's a lot of interesting, like, shooting bets, uh, like a 6'6 plus size in the later portions of the draft. But Jared Butler's different because I think Jared Butler is just such a versatile offensive player. He's because he just he's great on ball. He's great off ball. It seems like he he's very good at moving to. He's very good at like flaring to corners at the right time, and he can gather himself quickly for shots. Doesn't really matter contest. I, I've said it before where he um I, my friend Noah who runs the NBA Underground on Twitter uh he talked about he talks a lot about Shea Gill just Alexander how he basically it's so hard to guard him because all his moves look the same at a certain point. And it's just fair to guess. Like I feel like Jared Butler does that very well too, where he sets up basically all his crosses, his spins, his little hesitations. Like it looks like he's about to do any one of those moves, and then he can go to each of them. So you just combine that handle with the shot making, both on and off the ball, and just suddenly you have a guy that's like, yeah, like I think you could put him in any NBA offense, and I think it works. And that's just very valuable. And then defensively, like pro- like it's been said before, he probably shouldn't have been all Big Twelve defense. I don't think he's like a perfect defender, but like solid overall uses strength again, like decently shifty, like guards are limited in their defense overall, pretty much unless you're like unbelievable. Like if you're under six, five in the NBA, like the defense just, I don't think that's why you're picking the player. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I, that just, again, if the Sixers take Jared Butler at 28 on draft night, I'll be very happy. Cause I, I think he immediately just like, it's just another positive asset to your offense. I totally agree. I'm big on him. Last question before we wrap the show up. Do you have a guy that we haven't discussed yet uh, that you are just in love with that maybe not, may not be a top, you know, top 10 guy, but somebody that enough Twitter uh, accounts, you know, or, or, you know, basketball minds are talking about. Uh, Do we want to use this portion to talk about Kessler Edwards? We could, we could, our guy. That's my dude. Kessler Kessler's great. Uh, just again, like like I said, I love versatility and just how you can slot into an offense easily. Kessler basically just can shoot and shoots off of movement. He can't really shoot running to his left yet because it's like still some like uh, mobility issues and like center of gravity issues there. But he can shoot. He can swing his top leg around and shoot moving to his right really well. Then that's like enough ball handling or enough like like recognition to attack some closeouts. They run hard at him. And then defensively, just like you're getting guys six, seven, about six, ten wingspan, very good instincts, very smart positionally, can probably guard positions two through four pretty effortlessly in the NBA. I mean, I don't want to say effortlessly, but I think you can definitely put him at like, I, I think he's like capable of guarding multiple positions in the NBA. So it's again just like, yeah, do you need do you need another rotation player who can move around on offense and like, just you can set a bunch of screens and he'll run into shots like he's basically shot really well from three for three straight years on high volume. Like, yeah, he can do that. He just, you're, 
put him in your offense. He'll probably he'll probably help. And I think that's just so valuable. I bet, especially like later stage in the draft, once you're done, like in the lottery, swinging for like these high creation, like high usage up, upside bets. Like just taking a guy like that, who I'm pretty sure just has the versatility to play within any kind of context, is just so valuable. I totally agree. This is gonna be a fun draft. Like, I just I have no idea where it's gonna go after. After three, after three, I would say, like one, two, three, I think is going to be uh, Cunningham, Green, Mobley. Like Mobley is a shoe into Cleveland yeah. if he's there. And I would like, even though it's been reported, like it's not for sure. I would say like the smart money is on Jalen Suggs at four to the Raptors. But like, yeah, yep. and after that, like five to thirty, I don't know what's going to happen. Like at all, it's going to get nuts. Did you like that trade today? I didn't ask you about this earlier. That that Pelicans Grizzlies deal. I don't know what Memphis is doing. That that trade well, makes no sense for Memphis. Well, I think Memphis like is realizing like they weren't going to keep Jonas long term because I think they were going to have to pay him. But um, I so like Memphis's whole thing is like as people said, they're like one tall shot maker away, and you're less likely to get that bet at seventeen than at ten. So if there's probably a guy they like as that taller wing potential shot creator, and they're kind of going for it there, and that, also I think they did get picks in that too. So I kind of like it's in that perspective. I it's interesting what New Orleans is doing. It's like, man, like I don't know how again I don't know how the spacing works, but Jonas and Zion is a ton of rim pressure in one front court. Like just, I mean, it was already hurt to play Stephen Adams, but Yo- Stephen Adams into the post game that Jonas does. So like, <laughs> it's just weird. I don't know how I have. I'm gonna be so weird watching Jonas and Zion just like bash people inside. You also have Brand- you have Brandon Ingram on the front too. That's a massive front Dude, line. I, I, I think if I read correctly, I didn't look too much into it, but I'm pretty sure the Pelicans like opened up some cap space for them, like in case like basically this like helps them keep Lonzo in free agency. I'm pretty sure, or go after Kyle Lowry to reunite him with with Jonas. I think I think the move is for Josh Giddy from Australia at ten. That for, I mean that was one of the guys that was projected. Memphis. That w- that would be an interesting one, definitely. I could definitely. I could definitely hear that. Like, I mean, I think it is pretty good too. So that I, like, I, I honestly like. It's one of those weird trades where I have really. It's so. It was so odd and unexpected, and like, the implications of it are so like diverse for both sides. I don't know what to make of it. Like, I can't say right now today who I like it more for. But it's just. It's. I mean, it's a very weird trade. Cause like, had, there was no inkling of this at all. Uh, I mean, first Woj bomb, including Jonas Valanciunas. Like, I'm here for it. Um, Daniel, before we wrap up, do you have anything you want to plug for this week? I'm sure you're going to be a very busy man. Yeah, so uh, you can find me on Twitter at Dan underscore Olinger. Uh, I am the editor-in-chief at Inside and You, which is Northwestern's SB Nation site. We're always writing great content there, and we have a lot of stuff about the upcoming college football season, obviously centered around Northwestern, but some other stuff as well. Um, and then I am – Probably um, this week for Liberty Ballers, we are going to be having an NBA draft live stream on Thursday night, which you can go to the site and click on, uh, and we'll have the video hosted there. Fortunately, I've not been able to host it through Twitter because I don't know if this made the rounds, but like the Liberty Ballers Twitter got hacked like a week ago and we haven't gotten it back yet. That, I did I, see that. I went to go tag you in something earlier and I was like, uh, no, yeah, it's we're not sure when, it, when or if it will come back, which is rough, but um. Yeah, like just go to liveryballers.com and you can find find the draft live stream there. And yeah, it's basically all where you can find me. And thanks so much for having me on. Absolutely. It was an absolute pleasure. Daniel, we'll have you back on soon, uh, perhaps to talk about if Kessler Edwards goes to Philadelphia, I want all of the credit in the world. <laughs> uh, you got it, man. Perfect. Well, you have a great night, brother. Everybody, this has been episode 156 of Beer Sports Whatever on Around the Block. Make sure to check us out on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Have a great week. Happy Draft Week, everybody!